Hi, everybody. I'm Laurie Cadden. This is the 12th program that we're having here from the Lackawanna County Medical Society's Public Health Education Series, number 12, which means a whole year. We have a whole year coming up. Today we're talking about a very, very serious uh, subject, actually an epidemic, a crisis. All these words were thrown out earlier today. We are talking about recognizing and responding to drug overdose. We have with us today Lackawanna County Coroner. Timothy Rowland and Cynthia Bellino of Just Believe Recovery in Carbondale. So both of you, thank you for joining us thank here today. Me. We have uh, quite the topic. It and is. for someone who you hear it, I'm, I'm speaking I'm, from my standpoint, you hear about it, you guys see it all the time. I don't pay, I mean, you hear these little things. Mm -hmm. But when you just said before, Tim, that in 2003, we had 30, Deaths, drug deaths, drug deaths, and in 2015 there were 72. Correct. In Lackawanna County alone. In Lackawanna County alone. Right. It's more than one a week. <sighs> it's just unbelievable. So we're here to tell, to help you guys understand a little bit about what it, a drug overdose actually is, what can be done, mm -hmm. how you can be helped, and we'll go from there. So the first question is, what is an overdose? An overdose essentially is the uh, induction or ingestion or inhaling a, uh, sub a substance that's toxic to the body. In the, co in, the, uh, in the case of prescribed medications, it would be taking too many prescribed medications or over drugs that take you over the therapeutic level okay. and put you in danger of having these symptoms of an overdose. Okay. And what are the most common then drugs that people overdose on? Well, what we're seeing in the county as far as drugs that, that have, have related to death are number one and far above everything else are the opioids or the prescription narcotics that are typically administered for pain, pain management, and those drugs are your Percocet, Vicodin, Oxycontin, Oxycodone, no, that are no. prescribed by physicians. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to I'm going to show my ignorance here. I would assume that someone overdoses on something, and you wouldn't. And people who are addicted to these drugs, such as prescription drugs, that you don't ever overdose on that. It's this other stuff mm -hmm. that isn't that you're not actually that you're buying illegally or whatever else it is that would that's my perception I wonder how many other people think that because to say that you can overdose on prescription drugs I know addiction comes in but that's that's pretty powerful but you have to understand as you as you prescribe these medications and you take them uh, on a regular dosage regimen you gradually build a tolerance mm -hmm. to that medication and then eventually requires you to take more and the you know the course of human nature is is the better the people feel the more medication they'll take so then in that case if someone is actually taking and addicted to these pills and they're say what is the difference between knowing someone is overdosing versus someone who may be high when we, when we see people that are overdosing, they typically have signs of, you know, lethargy or um, uncommon behavior, not normal behavior. They appear to be sluggish. They could be semi-conscious, unconscious, uh, to completely out and, and eventually stop breathing or lose their heart rate. And usually the eyes roll back right before, like in the process. They're not just nodding out from using too much mm -hmm. dope, per yeah. se, heroin or something. Yeah. They're not just nodding out. Their eyes will roll backwards in their head when they're going into an overdose. So if someone is overdosing, okay. what is the length of time usually, or can you say that, to help someone in a situation like that? You, you can't say a, a specific mm -hmm. point of time. We have uh, people that we discover that we believe have died of overdoses of, let's, let's, use, let's use heroin. Mm -hmm. We find them in positions, it, which is exactly when the drug took effect, where they dropped to the floor, in the bed, on a counter. You know, we've had people like literally have stopped breathing, had no pulse, 
and passed away in a sitting position or even a standing position, leaning against an object. Mm -hmm. On heroin, the, generally with the, the syringe in their hand there, or near or their or body. in the yes. vein, right? Yes. Right That's, in their arm. Yep. Because you never know what you're getting in with the street drugs, number one. Okay, because they, they, they get them tainted drugs and things like that. They'll cut them with all kinds of things, and you don't know what you're getting. Mm -hmm. um, but just one of the things you talked about, the difference between the heroin, the illegal drugs, and the prescribed drugs. Mm -hmm. Our country's problem with the illegal drugs is only 10% of the problem. So most of it's prescription? 90% is prescription drugs, yes. Wow. They're overprescribed. Um, most of the drugs that are given to people today really weren't, should not be out of a hospital environment. That's how strong they are. But with the economy the way they are, insurance is not wanting to pay for hospital stays. They give them these drugs that really shouldn't be outside those four walls and send them home with them. You know, and that's really one of the problems. So the, everything has to be restructured in different areas and it's going to take a lot, but it takes people to talk about things and be honest about it. Yeah. Um, but and and not to interrupt, Cindy. But I, that's my point. I know that the abuse of prescription drugs. Yes. I just didn't realize, I guess, that people actually overdose on that. So that typically that was why I was saying I I, I didn't know there was you could do literally that well, that would happen. Yeah. In, in my experience, what has happened was if you went back a decade, when the the healthcare community decided that nobody should ever be in pain and they needed to create a way to measure it and then create a way to treat it. So if you went into the hospital, the emergency room typically, and you had belly pain and your pain scale on a one to 10 was a six, they were giving you narcotics for that and you, that would make you feel better to the point where more and more people were getting these drugs and then people started going to the emergency rooms to to get these drugs yeah. and they would have you know a variety of symptoms to get the drugs mm -hmm. to the point where I mean if you went back pre privacy rules you know emergency rooms used to share information on somebody that was drug seeking that came to the ER and then would leave there and go to another hospital they would share that information but when the privacy rules came into effect you absolutely can't do that anymore so it's nothing for somebody to go to hospital A in, in Scranton. Let's say go to regional hospital, get a prescription, go up the hill to Moses Taylor, get another prescription, go to Geisinger, get a mm. prescription, go to Wilkes-Barre, there's two more hospitals down there, get all these prescriptions, and then go to five or six different pharmacies, pay cash, and get them all filled. So that's what's going to make They're my question, that. though, They're is fixing that HIPAA now. then, is that helping or making it it's easier then? Well, hi, the, hi, the HIPAA, you know that was a, that was just that stopped that kind of unofficial right. reporting. The problem in Pennsylvania is we are the only state in the nation that does not have a a reporting system or a clearinghouse mm -hmm. where if the physician knew that the the person just obtained a prescription, they're not going to write another. We don't know that, and I think they are trying to fix it. Yeah, but I, I think pharmacy. I fear it's going to be a pharmacy-based system, mm -hmm. which will not be up to date and and the abuse will still You're occur. You're saying in Pennsylvania there in isn't Pennsylvania. and a lot of other states have it? Yes, Pennsylvania yeah. leads the nation in prescriptions and filling prescriptions yeah. for narcotics, wow. mainly opioids. So what happens, back to my original statement, is that these people become addicted to prescribed opioids, typically, and then when the scripts run out, the doctors won't write them anymore, or they can't afford to buy them on the street, they go to heroin. It's the it's cheapest drug on the market, wow. and and that's why we're mm -hmm. in this heroin crisis. Okay. Yeah. So it, it, there's something said. If people say if some is, do you, if you hit someone, bath salts, a shower, does any of that actually help in an overdose situation? Not if the not it, if the drug that was ingested or injected or inhaled is at the toxic level, giving them a shower is not gonna work. Although we see that a lot, especially in the ambulances. Um, what is gonna work is actually calling 911 and getting help on the way, which 
is an, is an issue. Nobody wants to be implicated. I, you know. I can get that. But there's so, new laws out for that now, too. That grant immunity yes. to somebody who calls. calls in them. other words, yes. doesn't hold them. But, I mean, drug overdose deaths, it's nothing to find somebody dead, deceased from an overdose, and they're by themselves, yep, everybody and they to. could be there for a day. So because people bolt at that they point. Bolt, they bolt, they, yeah. they they'll get clean arrested. Up, and clean up all the drugs, oh, yep. and they have value, you know, and yep. leave. Yeah. It's, a, it's like a cult almost. So then the something that can save them, as we were talking earlier, is is the Narcan that we, yes. ta we talked about and who can administer it and how it's administered. Could yeah. you shed some light on how that sure. happens, Tim? In, uh, you know, the, the, the pre-hospital community, paramedics, CMTs, were using Narcan back as early as the late 70s. Okay. And, uh, of course, we weren't, we didn't have the uh, quantity of people overdosing in the, in the 70s that we do today. So now we've allowed the Narcan, they've changed it from being an injectable, you can also, it is injectable, but now they've came out with Narcan that's administered to a nasal uh, mist that anybody could really use, and they've, they've let the EMTs, the basic EMTs, and the police and firefighter rescue services use the Narcan. And, uh, you know, in my opinion, until they actually let the drug users have it, and their friends who are with them, and family members have it. That's really where it's going to be real. It's effective now. They've had yeah. in Lackawanna County, we've had dozens of saves where the police arrive on time. Somebody actually dials 911. The police or the ambulance get there promptly, and give Narcan, and those people wake up. And what happens after they get that? After it's administered, what they happens? They go into then? withdrawal. They're in the, you, you, immediately. Yes. Mm -hmm. It's immediate. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you, so you have to know what then to do with the person who's going through the they withdrawal. They need to go to the hospital. To the hospital, yeah. Right. yeah. They often don't. Yeah. They often and sign. And they can go back out again. They often sign against medical advice and, mm -hmm. and don't go to the hospital. But they're actually now re recovered from the overdose. They're, they're, but they're re not going in the amp. They refuse. They're not to recovered the, from the overdose recovered. in the sense that the medication still remains in their system. Right, but but the Narcan just blocks the receptors that. Uh, allows them to not breathe okay. and affects their heart rate. So then they can just refuse to go? Is that what happens? Is mm -hmm. that what you're saying? So. Oh my goodness. In, in people that are unconscious and the paramedics put a tube in their trachea which goes between their vocal cords with the balloon on the end to protect the airway, when you give them the dose of Narcan, it'd be nothing for them to Take awake and pull, pull the tube out. right out and get out of the ambulance and yeah. And is it mostly because of the fear of th what they're doing or that they, they'll fear someone's going to make them go to recovery? Or, or is it all of those things? Well, it's all of those. The, but the, I think illegal, the, main, the, the legal, the elite, yeah. the illegal But I think drugs. the main thing is, is the reason they took the, the uh, medication to make them feel better, you just took that away. So they're, so now they're not, yeah. Or worse than well, they were before. It gets to a point in addiction where... The drugs don't work anymore. You're just miserable. Nobody wants to continue to live that way. There's not one addict that I know out there, to be honest with you, that wouldn't love to go and, and, and have their lives back. The fear of doing that is what keeps them from coming mm -hmm. forward. The fear of detox and the pain through that and the fear of the unknown. They'll go back to comfortable pain, which is part of addiction. Alcohol, you're saying addiction. Alcohol, mind-altering substance. It's all an addiction, mm -hmm. okay? So they're more comfortable going back to the familiar pain yeah. than, than the unknown. What's my life going to be without it? Because you have to remember, this is a disease they had way prior to picking up drugs and alcohol. Mm -hmm. The way that they think is totally different. The uh, not good enough syndromes, or having to live up to expectations, and, and it's just this whole thing. It's a whole part of the way the brain goes on these people. More extraordinary than a normal person has these few things, but not to this extreme. So when we get them clean, they come out the other side, guess what? They still have all the feelings, and they have to understand and learn about this disease and how it affects their thinking. And that's where treatment's important. And we do EMDR because in their, in their time that they're in active addiction, that's where most of their shame and guilt comes from because you couldn't do the things that these people do with a clear mind. That's why they call this stuff mind-altering substances. So we have to deal with what they've added to their lives and that chaos there along with that, because they're good people. 
Yeah. They're, uh, they're all good people. It's like that. You don't hate the person. You hate the, the disease. disease. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. But, but go back a little bit to Narcan. Let me ask you this, in that because I think that this is important. If somebody isn't overdosing and they get that, will it hurt them? No. or? No. Okay, so when someone goes and thinks there's an overdose, obviously the who's ever there will know that it is or it isn't, and, or they should at least. Right, and Narcan doesn't work for every Narcan doesn't work for every overdose. If you overdose on benzodiazepines, Narcan does not work for that. Narcan is for narcotic, morphine, Opiates. opiate based medication. Okay. And what about then, getting back to a little bit of what you were saying, Cindy, the rock bottom syndrome that people, and I, I've heard people say, they'll never hit rock bottom before they try to recover from these, these uh, well, drugs a lot of in general. A lot of the rock bottoms are caused, um, you know, each person's bottom's different. I know. And you don't and always have to have, they have they the rock have, bottom. Right. That's what I well, mean. Well, a lot of people don't have to because they have enablers in their lives. Right. And that's why it's a family disease. And we have, you know, we have a lot of good meetings in this area, and we're opening one up there to make it more convenient for people to get out and learn about the codependency aspect mm -hmm. of this disease. Yeah. Well, you can't have one without the no, other, No, you right? can't. Right. And then you can be dual diagnosed like myself, and I had both, so that was fun for years, you know. Both as far as what? Uh, active addiction and, and, and codependency. codependency. Oh, okay. yes, and every addict has codependency issues. And I then know. we do EMDR for, you know, there's a lot involved with... Uh, Treatment. Recovery is different than treatment. It's totally different. It's a way of life mm -hmm. that they have to learn. You yeah, because it's the rest of your life to be. You of always have to be in that. Because they think different. Right. I think different. If I sat here and, and you could hear what my mind says sometimes, you'd be like, wow, you are different. I says, yes, I am. But I'm very blessed today to be different because I can understand these people I work with. I can't understand, just to cut real short, if a uh, loss of a child, thank you God, okay? I can't understand that pain. I can have empathy and sympathy, but I don't know that pain. So I can't you, really help that person. You know, when I'm dealing, you know, when I deal with the families that, that, and we're seeing now, you know, we used to see like age 30 and up, and now we're seeing kids that are down, you know, we had a couple kids last year, high school age. And now we're seeing, you know, and when I'm dealing with the families, it's, it is generally these, these uh, drug users are not, this is something that just didn't happen. This has been a trail of events. It would be a addicted to the drugs, discovery, a rehab, come out of rehab, clean or sign themselves out of rehab, yeah. and then relapse, re-overdose. Sometimes they take the same dosage that they took after they were clean, before they were clean for months. They mm -hmm. take the same dosage and they're dying from that. But when I'm dealing with the families, you know, they're like the loss of a child, yes. the loss of a brother, the loss of a yes. mother, you know, whatever the case may be. These people are uh, uh, emotionally destroyed, Yes, obviously. And then, you know, then they're in the guilt, you know, like, God, well, I wish we could have done more. Yeah. You know, and from my perspective I'm thinking you know they did a lot it just sometimes did. they do too so much. I think addicts people who are using on a regular basis you know I think their heart may tell them after they've like overdosed rehab and you know they steal to fund to the get, drug habit right, right and they end up in jail and when you end up in jail there's no drugs in jail so they're, or they're in drug treatment court or whatever where they're supervised they get out of there and I think their heart tells them I need to stop this. I need to change my life. But mm -hmm. I think these drugs does so not powerful. let their brain mm -hmm. let mm -hmm. you do this. Mm -hmm. it's, they you call know. it the grips of addiction, total devastation. You lose your soul if you believe in a soul. You lose hope. But for families, it's, I call it tough love. Yeah. You know, I had a, a nephew that's a heroin addict that, thank God, is clean for a while, like years. But I mean, you know, the same thing, you know, jail, gun charges, you know, but, you know, he's, he's worked through it and he's fine. Well, they say that the three, it's either recover, death, or, or jail, Jails right? I mean, right. It's, or death. That, it's where you yes. end up if you can't, I mean, because yes. the grip that it has yes. on people and mm -hmm. therefore then, Tim, as you said, the families and how they have to cope with it and deal yes. with it and the tough love part, because there's the part where you know you have to stop being the codependent enabler and you have to 
pull all that in when it could be a child of yours, just using that as an example. How do you do that? And there's so much, There, uh, one thing I'll say, there's a lot of help out yes, there. Yes, there is. So in your case, Cynthia, you, you guys do this. This is what you do. Mm -hmm. You, As you said, you've how, how long did it take you to decide or to understand that you needed to get the help you needed? To stay oh, when I finally get clean like, and done with everything, right. with anything. <laughs> um, I was in my 30s. And how long and were I you And I was active? one of those users that, you know, I was didn't use it all for a year, two years, and then I would just kick use it, and, and it would kick in, you know. And I could maintain. It, we call that like, you know, people that can maintain, like an alcoholic. Like you a know? functioning alcoholic. A functioning alcoholic, <laughs> for God's sakes. I know. You know, they're the hardest ones because they go to work. And, and they get, yeah. Right? And they, and they take a bath and, mm -hmm. and we're doing good. Yeah. But they don't understand how it's affecting the family, the family mm -hmm. and just them themselves. They're not, they're not being able to live their life to the full capacity of what they can do. And the stigma attached and the secrets and the lies and the, the, stigma and has the to honesty go. that some people have, I see where their families are dealing with this. Right. I think it's so much easier, it's based on what they tell me, to be honest about where they are mm -hmm. and not try to hide it as though it doesn't exist. It feels they get more help that way. Yeah, the the secrets, family feels the secrets, better. The yeah. secrets, the it's family secrets. secrets. It's terrible. You know how many things stem back to family secrets that we deal with today in the dual diagnosis thing? I know it. So people need to get honest and stop being ashamed of something that they have no control over, neither does the addict. The only thing they can do is make some healthy choices. I tell parents, you keep it up and you're like putting another nail in their coffin. I'm going to tell you a story real quick. Uh, last Thursday, wonderful young man, 22 years old, down in Florida, wants to go home after seven days. I got this. I want to go to outpatient. I got this. I want to be a diesel mechanic, and we did some stuff with him. I almost had him to stay. He went and got on the phone with his mother, which we spent an hour and a half trying to talk to his parents and say, do not do this. Make him stay where he's at. Monday morning, he went home Friday, Monday morning, he was dead in his oh bed because he gosh. wasn't going to use because they never plan on it. They really believe they're not going to yeah. use. But, you know, the other side of that is we, you know, we had a couple younger people. That one was a, a girl who was in a sober house in Scranton. Yeah. Sober okay. houses. Sober house, left the sober house with a friend who text messaged her through Facebook and picked her up and took her to a place where they obtained drugs. She went back to the sober, sober house, yep. went in her room, closed the door, took the injection, died, we think, immediately, yep. and wasn't discovered for the entire, e the entire night till the morning. Where's the sober house manager? Well, they didn't, they thought, you know, she went in, to, but I'm not, you know, I'm just saying, but, but these drug dealers are predatory. Yeah. They're sending them messages saying, hey, when you know, when you're ready to use again, I'm We're here. We're here, yeah. We're here, and that's... Well, Tim, is, is with heroin, is, and as you said earlier too, Cynthia, is that the stuff that kills you instantly, is, is that really the bad Oxycodine, stuff? Like they say, well, they shoot up. They well, I've heard someone say they, they it's a bad dose of heroin. Now. I mean, what does that mean? Well, when, when it's in our area, when people, you know, through media or whatever, when they see you know, a, a, a run of young people dying. And, you know, and it, they read the newspaper, the obituaries, and when you see somebody that's 26 years old that died at home, I mean, people, yeah, you, you know, they, you know they killed themselves right. or they took drugs or something right. like that. But when, when the, uh, you know, when they're thinking that we've had five or six of them, or, I mean, I'm candid about it. I mean, I would say to somebody, you know, they'll say to me, how, hey, how was your weekend? And I'd say, well, you know, the week was good, and then we had three drug deaths on the weekend, and and they'd say, "Well, there must be a bad batch of heroin." It's not a bad. It's not necessarily. Sometimes, sometimes it is, and and now you know they're they're cutting the heroin. The they're cutting the heroin with okay. fentanyl, which is like a, uh, it's like a. What does that mean? Fentanyl is a another pain pill. opiate yep. pain narcotic pill. that is distributed and used by patches generally. They made them in a pill form now. But they, they put patches on and the medication, it's really used therapeutically for cancer people, cancer patients, mm -hmm. people in deep pain, and it's closely monitored. It's a patch and the medication is transferred through a membrane into the skin, transdermally. The addicts, when they get the patches, and we found them deceased God. with the patches in their mouth. Oh they try to pull it out to shoot it up too, Well, though. they chew it. 
Yeah. Because in a patch that's administered transdermally, mm -hmm. you know, that medication is time released. When you take a patch and you scoop the medication out of it or chew the medication out of it, you're getting that whole it's not dosage. time release no more. Yeah. No, you're getting it yeah. all once and they're done. And we just had a young young guy. But now they're making it in pill form, for God's sakes. And that's like, they call it the new Xanax. Okay, because the kids were taking Xanax. I think it was a thing, if you added up all the Xanax that was prescribed in America, um, it would have been like taking, I forget how many, an enormous amount for the whole world. We don't day. get too many, we don't not get a lot of overdoses right. that are Xanax only. Right. Xanax Mixed, or right? Alprazolam and they're benzodiazepines. Yep. And we do not get where it's individually the benzo that, that makes them die. It's used in combinations with a lot of other things, including the opiate based products. So what happens when somebody when someone does overdose and they recover from it. What are, are there long-term effects to their body? Is it depend on the person, on how, how severe long. it was, what the drug was? Yeah. What, what would be well, brain a damage way? damage is one the, if they don't Brain damage them. is, yeah. is, is the, big. I mean, yeah. people, Oxygen. yeah, people mm -hmm. stop breathing. Okay. Okay, so then the uh, public safety people respond and yeah. administer Narcan and they start breathing again, but they have been without oxygen for greater than, you know, the, the range is four to six minutes, and your brain dies. And mm -hmm. so these people are transported to the hospital with, with the blood pressure and a pulse, but no, you know, even Narcan, no consciousness level, and no, no, you know, they're not awake. And then uh, they die in the hospital, they're declared brain dead several days later because their brain had died because of lack of oxygen. Mm -hmm. We call those anoxic brain injuries, actually. Where it's not really an injury in the sense that somebody struck them, it's from no oxygen. Mm -hmm. yeah. And these generally are all accidental deaths. Yeah. So, Cindy, tell everybody, it's the simplest term, but describe what a rehab actually is. Well, it's it's a short term for rehabilitation, mm -hmm. okay? And they just nicked it and named they cut it short there? with drugs, you know, right. drug rehab, you know? Well, first of all, uh, we do five phases. So at first you detox. And detox is just to get the uh, chemicals, you know, out of their system and make them comfortable through detox and, and, and get the chemicals out as much as you can. So there's not that fog that they're in. After that, you go into a 30-day program. And the program starts to deal with uh, trauma and a whole bunch of stuff that's involved with treatment. We do EMDR work. We have therapists. They do one-on-one -on -one with therapists, large groups. And you get them to start maybe talking about some things. And it takes time. 45 days, your light bulb usually clicks if you can get them for th 45 days, actually. But then that's only 30 days. Then we have a PHP program, level one and two. It's still almost like a residential, but you have a little bit more freedom because you can go out with the techs outside the place for a while. Second phase, which is about two weeks, depending on what the therapists think they need. And uh, then they can get a job because they have to learn to be fully self-efficient. They have to learn life on life's terms again. Okay, and then after that, at that point of the game, they have anywhere between 60, to 90, and I have some clients that have been with me for a hundred and some days in their scholarship because the insurance sometimes pay for 10 days worth of rehab. But we, you can't put them out. Not if you're really doing, you know, what, I, what, I, correct what I'm doing. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm trying to help them save their own lives. So we do a lot, we help um, the county and their funding, you know, they help with the different um, detox X amount of days and they'll give them so many days in, um, residential program, but even the MAs, we have, I help everybody. So the MAs, but we're not okay, Jeff, for the uh, PHP and outpatient. And so I'll scholarship a lot of them because they're in their groups, they have their, their, their counselors, they have their therapists, they know the psychiatrist, they're used to the doctor, they're used to the recovering process is starting to click now for them and they're starting to feel comfortable with this group of people because they're all doing the same thing. So sending them somewhere else isn't going to help them, you know, because maybe MA will pay at a different place. But That's not the point. What about people who go to an outpatient versus an inpatient? Don't work. Right. Uh, you need therapy. Is there therapy. any... any uh, if you're an addict, a real addict, I mean, some people, and I'm sure 
you'll agree, some people just get addicted to addictive medications. And those are easier to work with, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? To get them off. A real true addict is, you know, it's a disease on the way they think, the way their mind works. Okay, so no, they'll tell you that, like my friend last week was going home, towel patient, so he could go to work. Because they don't, they, you know, they're all. That's what the fear is with the outpatient. Is the work is that how yeah. do they get out of their their yeah. job if they have one for that length of time? Now PHP, and you can do that. Out, go home and do PHP. PHP stands for partial hospitalization. Okay. That's so many hours a day. They can come at nighttime and do that if they have to go back to work. But you need to at least, and they have to be accountable. They have to do what they have to do before they can even start the recovery. You're just trying to take a broken piece of porcelain and put it back together. But don't a lot of them really try and shortcut it? Well, because they, they, you know, let me tell they, you why, because they, they're taking it as a hand, a hand out instead of a hand up. And that's a problem I'm having with the, with the medical assistance, because it's free, or my scholarship people. Okay, I, I, like in November, December, I scholarship 20 people. But the thing of it is, is it's like carte blanche, these young kids carte blanche. I don't like it. I don't like you telling me what to do, so I'm going to go to another rehab. Mm -hmm. And they, you know, and, they, and they'll take them. We take people twice. You come in, you go out, you relapse. We'll take you back one more time. If you're not serious, it's a year before we'll take them back. Go somewhere where it's going to get you help. But because then another, we're about another issue, Cindy, was the insurance companies were not paying for the full stay. That's, right. a, no, that's, that's the biggest problem. That came not, up at a panel I was on the what? other day where somebody yeah, said, you know, this has to change. And what, what was the general consensus? Well, I mean, they're, too, they're trying to do it through legislation, you know, yeah. to, to mandate the, you know. Because if you're saying it's a, typically a 45-day. Or longer. Or longer. And these facilities are usually third 28, 30 days. Sometimes. Sometimes. I know there's longer. But do we have in locally, do we have. Let me have tell you the biggest mistake they're making right now. And I know a lot of people don't want to hear this that are making money on this. Outpatient and outpatient detox is, is crazy. Because what they're using basically for outpatient detox are, are medications that are opiate based, which is your methadones and your suboxins. We don't use that. We do not use that. We are going to start administering a, a shot. And I did take the shot first and put myself with the doctors and everything around to make sure. I won't give them anything because I am an addict. And if you want expert advice on what medications, do ask an addict. And they'll tell you, I have to detox them off Suboxone. I have to detox them off of methadone. And then we can start the whole recovery process because that's not recovery, OK? So this shot that I've taken, it does block the receptors in the mind for alcohol and opiates. But that's all it does. It's not, this is the answer. You have to do treatment. You have to deal with the disease the of your mind because you're a yeah. sick person, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? And then you have to learn how to live your life and, and, and maintain that. So then rehab really, to be clear, is, is not recovery, but the beginning to try to recover, that's really- Putting the pieces would, back together. In the, in the, in the rehab phase, what, when do you believe recovery starts yeah. in any way in Planting that time? Planting the seed okay. of recovery, the 12 steps. Like I remember some girls come in, they says, oh, I already did my, I already did my fourth steps in, in rehab. I says, really? That's really good. I'm glad to hear this. And we're going to do a real one now. <laughs> okay? Because okay. you don't do a fourth step in a matter of 30 days, for God's sakes, okay? Or an inventory, you know? And you just don't do that. But we plant the seed. Okay. Because you look at the 12 steps and you don't, you know, you're looking at somebody telling you you're powerless. We're survivors out on the street. What do you mean I'm powerless? You know? Yeah. And the whole way they think, you know? They don't understand all this. It looks like it's, when it did for me, it looked like it was written in Chinese. I'm looking at this going, this isn't going to work for yep. me. Because first of all, I'm not teachable. What clicked for you? <sighs> surrender. When you get to the point where you actually surrender. When you start saying, I wonder really, that person, when I close my eyes and I can picture, I wonder if that could really be the real person I was meant to be. And actually, it's tenfold more than that. You know, I mean, it really was for me. You know, I mean, um, this whole thing that I'm doing right now, I never in a million years planned on opening a rehab, for God's sakes. Yeah. That was like the furthest thing for me to do. You know, I, I had a cleaning company for 21 years in Florida. I didn't plan on opening a rehab, but 
I just got tired because I've been involved in recovery for 20 some odd years. Mm -hmm. And I just got tired of seeing how it was being done. And I'm thinking, well, somebody has got to do it right. And you might, like I said, we're not going to be the richest we have around. But you know what? My bills are paid. Yeah. And people's lives are being saved. And I see miracles every day. Every single and day. And that's, that's all you can ask for because. What do you want to do? What yeah. do you want to do? Yeah. You know, what is I'm it you're in the miracles. business for? You're not. I'm not seeing miracles. Yeah. Well, you come hang out with me. <laughs> <laughs> I even said the Pope should come out and hang out you with know, me because it's amazing. There's, there's the, you know, the, the issues of the, are, are broad. The issues are the access to the drugs that lets people yeah. get addicted. You know, yeah. uh, you go to the dentist for a root canal and they're giving you, you know, 10 days of Vicodin. I mean, they push it. Yeah. So the access to the drugs, the, uh, you know, I'm not saying that the doctors over for, over prescribe. There are doctors that over prescribe. Um, but the issue is like, if you go to the emergency room and, and the doctor does not give the person the medication that he wants, they report them to the department of health and they're in, they're, you know, inspecting them. Yeah. You know, it's like, so that it's probably easier for it's the doctors cycle. just to give it. But, you know, I think the drug companies have a stake in this. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, when we went to measuring pain and treating pain, I mean, you know, the, they made a ton of money uh, on that. Mm -hmm. The drug companies, the prescribers, but I really, really think that this tracking system, clearing house, call it what you want, is something that we need desperately. And I've read the, you know, the, the bill that, that yeah. they're trying to enact, and I don't think it works. I don't see and why the drug company don't copy lobbies the other people. Don't want that, I think. No, they yeah. don't. There's no money in the cures. Well, okay? yeah. And the answers, <laughs> you're not. So in the meantime, I can't even so, get my ventilator for my asthma if I already got it in Florida, and I call to get it from a pharmacy and say Walgreens. They're connected. They said you, you know, can't get that for three more days. But the other stuff you can. But I no, think they you know. Can, but they're not the, connected the here. The crisis is keeping, especially our our children, is you know doing whatever it takes to not have them Education. exposed to this. Mm -hmm. And you know, I tell, I was at a, uh, uh, at a Abington Heights the other night and I told the parents, I said, you know, when your kids come home, look at them, talk to them, you know, confront them, see what they've been doing. When you're noticing changes in their behavior, watch their spending habits. I mean, they're getting the money or parents, watch your medication. Parents have, you know, 14, pills for pain or benzodiazepines or whatever, they'll take two thinking that mom and dad won't notice that. Exactly. I mean, there's, a, but, but mm -hmm. if you are not, I get vigilant would be the word. If you, if you yeah, just you don't take that time, your kid, you know, the likelihood is if your kid comes in contact with this stuff and he starts taking it and they become addicted to it, mm -hmm. the likelihood that they'll ever, ever get off that is not Without good. some help. They need right. help. They're going to yeah. need help. Yeah. Well, in general, we all need that. That's the mm -hmm. thing. We all need to be to pay attention to your family, to your friends, to 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 see what's there, to see because a lot of time, Tim, you'd agree, it's right there in front of you, and and we're Absolutely. not looking at it, right? Yeah. We don't either. We're not paying attention, or we don't think it's what it is, right? And denial. that goes back to yep. denial and yep. fear that oh, yep. this can't be me, so I'm going to pretend mm -hmm. it doesn't. It, it's yep. not here. Yeah, exactly. So you have to be much more, as you said, vigilant and and pay attention. So we hope that this series has given you a little bit more information on a lot more information it's given me on uh, drug overdoses and recognizes and responding to them and I appreciate your time ladies and gentlemen and the, we're joining me today was um, Lackawanna County Coroner Tim Rowland along with Cindy Bellino who is with Just Believe Recovery in Carbondale. Good luck to both of you going Thank forward you. with good this and hopefully yeah, good luck to you. if we, we see this again these numbers here. go down for 2016. That'd be awesome. I yeah. know. Yeah. So we hope that. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you for watching. We appreciate it. We'll see you next month with another wonderful series and uh, have a great week. I'm Laurie Cadden. Thanks for watching.